Wrestling with the Past, hosted by Jason Knopp. Join Jason as he reviews classic wrestling footage from the golden era of the WWF. When our biggest childhood fear was anyone from the dreaded Heenan family capturing the precious World Wrestling Federation gold from our red and yellow savior, Hulk Hogan. There were rowdy pipers, snookas who superflied, animals with green tongues, Russian Volkovs, sheiks of iron, a demolition that could axe and smash things to bits. <laughs> it was a glorious time to be alive. It was a time to rock and wrestle. When a video coliseum fulfilled our childhood world with excitement and wonder. And now, the host of Wrestling with the Past. Give it up, give it up, give it up for Mr. Jason Nup. What's up, guys? Jason Nup, New Age Revolution, down here in the cave for another episode of Wrestling with the Past. Today, we are going to take a look at the first half of June 1984. Now, I... Uh, I was going to do month by month, but what I'm realizing is that there's a lot of footage, and I have probably, well, we're averaging, what, like four championship wrestling shows a month, there's four TNT episodes a month, and usually there's at least two or three house shows a month. <laughs> so that that's a lot of wrestling to try to fit into one 20-minute episode. Uh, so we're not going to do that. We're just going to break the month down into either half or thirds. Uh, so we're going to talk about the first third of June 1984, and there's plenty to talk about. There's a lot happening. Uh, first update, I have started painting Mr. Perfect, my LJN from XOX Customs. XOX by Random Treasures on Etsy. You guys went nuts with them, and uh, they are very, very happy. And so our little commercial for them uh, brought like like a five hundred percent increase in sales overnight. You know, they were averaging like three sales a day, and you guys like brought like fifteen sales overnight to them. Which is amazing. That's exactly what I was hoping for. They are great people, and the more we buy, the more they're going to make. So let's keep it going. So I have started painting uh, my Mr. Perfect, and I am by no means a painter at all. Um, there's definitely going to be some scraping. You know, the, they told me that the trick is to take a tooth a toothpick and scrape outside, you know, if you go outside the lines, I gotta clean up Mr. Perfect's arm there. I already got some schmutz on it. This is the first coat of uh, the outfit. I'm going with baby blue. Boots are done, and the eyes are kinda done. Don't get freaky, guys. I'm not a painter, and that's, that's about the best I can do for eyes. They're not easy. So uh, Mr. Perfect's coming along nicely. We're gonna get a nice, uh, Maybe a dirty blonde hair going with uh, mixing up my paints. and So according to XOX by Random Treasures on Etsy, my friend Nett, uh, she's, she gave me some bad news. Mm -hmm. uh, there should be some very bad news coming in the mail soon. I don't know what kind of bad news that could be, but there's definitely some bad news coming for the LJN shelf, and that bad news is going to be available to all of you guys as well. Okay, without any further ado, let's get into June 1984. Uh, June 2nd, 1984, we've got a Philadelphia Spectrum house show. Now, when I do these, I'm not going to talk about the entire card uh, unless something um, out of the ordinary happens or something that I think would be of interest to you. Uh, the two things I will talk about on that card is we've got an intercontinental title defense, uh, Tito Santana, who is 
mm, couple of months out from losing the Intercontinental title to Greg Valentine, uh, Tito Santana defends against Dr. D. David Schultz. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that match is it's actually a great match, and it's and it's like a, um, I don't know, those two going together is kind of a strange combination for me. I, I usually don't remember Dr. D taking on anybody, of, you know, other than like Hogan and then some job guys, or like tag team matches with Piper and Orndorff, but Dr. D gets his title defense, or a title shot against Tito Santana uh, in that match... That is a straight up Tito win, I believe. I probably should have, probably should have wrote that down. I'm pretty sure that was a straight up Tito win, pinfall, I believe. Anyway, the other match on the card of note is Hogan versus Iron Sheik. Now, uh, Hogan wins the title in January '84, obviously, and there are there's a lot of dancing going on upstairs right now. Uh, there's there's several rematches that kind of flew under the radar between Hogan and Iron Sheik because, in my head, once the Iron Sheik lost the belt, he had no more. There was there was no there was no concern that he was going to get the belt back in a rematch. It just wasn't going to happen. Hogan went through him so dominating and so convincingly in their title change match that it, it, it just blew Iron Sheik out of title contention in, in, in our eyes. Made him look bad. Made him look weak. Uh, the match at MSG is not that great. Um, it's historical, but it's not that great. The rematches are fantastic between Hogan and Iron Sheik. I believe there's one at MSG. Maybe. This one is at Philly. There's definitely one at maybe Boston or Cap Center or something like that, but there's a couple of Hogan Sheik main events in the big house show circuit. I'm sure they went around the horn, around the country, doing rematches, but on TV, the big four, you know, Boston, Philly, MSG, and, and uh, Cap Center, there's at least two or three Hogan Sheik matches. The one from Philly, January, uh, uh, sorry, June 2nd, 1984, is tremendous. It's a great match. Uh, there's blood. You know, Hogan, uh, you know, rips the boot off the Iron Sheik and just pummels him with it. Uh, Iron Sheik's a great seller. I love, I love competitive Iron Sheik matches, especially when he, when it, you know, when he's got to get his butt kicked against, you know, Slaughter or Hogan. Sheik flops himself around the ring. Sells great. Love it. Uh, so we got some blood in that match, and it's a better match than their five-minute MSG match in, in January. Uh, June 5th, 1984, we've got an episode of Tuesday Night Titans. This is my favorite WWF show. Very, 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 very close edging out Saturday night's main event. I know that that's controversial, but I just love Tuesday Night Titans for so many reasons. Uh, if you're not familiar, for whatever reason, Vince McMahon decided he wanted a uh, Johnny Carson-style Tonight Show uh, blended into WWF programming. So, you know, McMahon has a, a, a talk show studio, a Tonight Show studio. He's got Lord Alfred Hayes as his uh, henchman, you know, as his, as his sidekick. And he brings out wrestlers and interviews them and then shows matches in between. There's skits. There's a ton of comedy. There's a lot of adult humor. Um, there's some, some kayfabe challenging stuff going on. It's pretty good. I love it. And uh, what stands out from the June 5th, 1984 episode, which is on the WWE Network on Peacock, you know, for four ninety nine a month, you get all this stuff. And my TNTs on disc are com are incomplete. I don't have all of them. Um, the Peacock Network has all but one. So I'm watching them there. They're not really cut down all that much. They're fine. On the June 5th episode, uh, we've got an interview with Mr. Fuji, which is fantastic because Mr. Fuji is just hilarious. He, he giggles and laughs the whole time. He's so sadistic, so evil, so great. Uh, and, he, and he's just got this just evil smile on his face the whole time. 
Uh, so what TNT would usually do is they would do, especially with like foreign wrestlers or international wrestlers, whatever, they would do like a cultural skit with them. And so for Mr. Fuji, uh, the TNT studios is transformed almost into like a, almost like a, I don't know, like a Japanese restaurant type setting. There's a table, there's tea, um, you got to take off your shoes. So Mr. Fuji leaves the interview and then as they come back from break, they do a skit where McMahon and Alfred Hayes are guests at this Japanese traditional tea drinking ceremony thing. And this is where the kayfabe thing comes into play because Mr. Fuji then suddenly turns into a good guy and he's, you know, welcoming Lord Alfred and welcoming Vince McMahon and he's taking off their socks. And then he calls a geisha girl out, right? And she's serving uh, McMahon. She's taking McMahon's socks off and she's washing his feet before he goes and sits down. It's very creepy, but very hilarious because Mr. Fuji is yelling at this geisha girl the entire time and just like insulting her and just, you know, ordering her to take care of McMahon, which probably wasn't that far off in real life. Um, and then at one point uh, she's pouring the sake yeah, that's right. It's not tea. It's sake. She's pouring the sake for McMahon, and she, you know, she's nervous, so she spills the sake. And Mr. Fuji goes absolutely insane and screams at her and threatens her. I mean, it's so, it's just so dated. It's it's so great. It's it's so funny. Um, also on the episode, uh, Salvatore Bolomo is interviewed, and they talk about his real life hobby of making uh, paper boats out of newspaper and magazines. So so he's interviewed, and then they show clips of like his home, of him making boats, and then they set him up at a little table and they have him make a boat out of a WWF magazine. So for the rest of the two hours, he's making a boat. He's just sitting there making a boat, like rolling up paper really tight, making a boat. It's great. And then Big John Studd comes out, and Big John Studd is a guest. And, and again, a little, a little push in the kayfabe thing. He's very calm. And, um, you know, talking about Andre and talking about Hogan and gives Andre credit, you know, and gives Hogan credit. Uh, but then they go to a match with Stud and Salvatore Belomo. And, you know, he beats him and then Belomo's like, ah, oh, he just got lucky. And, and then Stud's getting angry at Belomo and he walks over and they have like a little confrontation. I thought he was going to destroy the boat and the table, but he didn't. But it's so cool. And, and, and it's just so great. It's, it's, and McMahon is like trying so hard to be a straight talk show host. Lord Alfred Hayes is just silly and goofy. I love TNT. All right, so that takes us to uh, June 9th, 1984, a championship wrestling episode. Some highlights from that. We've got uh, Jesse Ventura is starting to show up. Uh, he is one of my least favorite in-ring performers. Uh, I can't stand him. I, I, he's terrible in the ring. I don't like him. Um, and I don't know where the whole, you know, look at my body gimmick went. He's really not in that great of shape. Don't get me wrong. He's obviously strong and, you know, there's some muscles. But he's, he's fat, you know. There's, there's, he's not lean and the muscles are not defined. So I don't know where Jesse the body Ventura came in. Not that great of shape. Um, okay, so big stuff. We have two Piper's Pits this week on uh, championship wrestling because they would also do a Piper's Pit on WWF All-Star Wrestling. Well, they needed to show this. So what happens is we've got the Piper's Pit for championship wrestling, the one that was supposed to air. We've got more Cindy Lauper stuff. Um, on, on last week's episode, Dave Wolf the manager, I think, slash boyfriend at the time of Cindy Lauper, was on Piper's Pit and was denouncing Captain Lou and saying he's not Cindy Lauper's manager, I'm her manager, we don't have anything to do with Lou, you know, he's a little, you know, he's a little crazy. And Roddy Piper's being very nice to him and David Wolf's doing a very good job. And, uh, and so that's it. David Wolf sets the story straight. Well, then the next week, it's Piper and Captain Lou again, and this time, Roddy Piper says, look, 
you know, you couldn't get her on the show. We had Dave Wolf on the show last week. I went out and got Cindy Lauper. Next week, Cindy Lauper will be here on Piper's Pit with Captain Lou Albano. And we're here. It's starting to begin. It's beginning the war to settle the score. It's beginning WrestleMania, the Rock and Wrestling Connection. It's all happening right now. So next week's Piper's Pit, which would be June 15th, I think we're going to see Cindy Lauper, and I know what happens. Like she just tells off Lou Albano. I think she storms off. It starts the whole thing. Well, that's the Piper's Pit that originally aired. They also went to a very serious Piper's Pit with Mean Gene Okerlin sitting all by himself in Piper's Pit, with that very very serious something bad has happened voice that we've all heard from the wrestling announcers. And he says, parental guidance, ladies and gentlemen, is suggested. The Piper's Pit, uh, an incident happened recently on Piper's Pit that has shocked us all. I, I recommend you get the children out of the room. If you are uncomfortable with violence, you should look away. And they show from All-Star Wrestling, which I don't have, uh, All-Star Wrestling, the famous... Roddy Piper versus Jimmy Snuka Piper's Pit, where we've got the coconut smashing over Snuka's head. We've got Snuka collapsing through the pit stage, the pit set, collapsing it down to the floor. We've got Piper whipping him and spitting at him. We've got Snuka absolutely freaking out and chasing after Piper. We get that. We get a view of the backstage, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, this was huge for me as a kid. I remember being absolutely terrified of it as a kid as well. I thought it was so intense as a kid. I was terrified for Snooka. I was terrified of Snooka when he does the freak out and chases after Piper. Piper slams a door. Snooka runs into the door. He's banging the door. Uh, right away, a couple of guys come out to carry off Snooka, and he's just making these wails and screams. You can't understand what he's saying. Wow. Amazing. It happened, and they showed it on this episode of Championship Wrestling. Um, we also get um, the Iron Sheik taking on Private Terry Daniels, uh, Sergeant Slaughter's recruit into the uh, Cobra Corps. And, um, you know, uh, Iron Sheik is beating him and, and, and is getting a little rough with him. And uh, Sergeant Slaughter makes the save and, and you know, uh, knocks Sheik out of the ring. So I thought it was cool that uh, we got Sheik versus Terry Daniels, but not much of a fight, unfortunately, for Terry Daniels. Uh, during this time, we've got a guy named Billy Travis is uh, jobbing on WWF TV. He went on to a little bit more fame in uh, Tennessee, you know, with Lawler and Jeff Jarrett. Uh, Billy Travis. Uh, then from there, we have a uh, cap center in Baltimore, Maryland, a Capital Center house show from June 9th, 1984 as well. Uh, on that card, we've got a couple of interesting things. We've got uh, Greg Valentine versus Salvatore Belomo. Now, why is that interesting? Well, uh, because at one point in the match, uh, the second rope breaks. And uh, it's just laying there on the ground. And the referee is, you know, everybody's kind of frantic. And the referee's trying to put it back together. And the stage hands are all trying to get it back to. But what I noticed was that Valentine and Belomo didn't miss a beat. In fact, uh, the rope breaks, and Greg Valentine lip picks it up. It's still connected to the other three turnbuckles, but he picks up the loose end and he throws it at Salvatore Belomo. And Salvatore Belomo grabs it and runs up to Valentine and starts choking him with it. And I just thought that that was the coolest thing that these guys just totally ad libbed. And, and brought the rope into play, and I thought it was great. You know, they, they, they didn't miss a beat. In fact, the match went on without a second rope attached on one side, and uh, they probably ended it a little early, but there was no, there was no panicking. No, they just did their thing, and, but used the rope, and I just thought, uh, how, how, you know, impromptu... Uh, to grab the rope, to throw it at Belomo, then Belomo picks it up and starts choking Valentine with it, and uh, I loved it. I, I just, you know, there's, I just went with it, and, and you know, that's a very Markish thing for me to say, but they just flowed with it, and I thought it was great. Uh, we've got Jimmy Snuka versus Dr. D. David Schultz on this card. That's pretty much the, uh, uh, the second uh, main event or, on, on the card. Uh, and this match is interesting because it is it is post uh, Piper's Pit, 
So Snooka's angry, and you see a lot of like intensity coming from the Superfly. This is actually a good match. A lot of stalling, a ton of stalling on Doctor D's part. He spends the first ten minutes of the of the match, um, you know, doing this to Snooka, and and like I don't know what what he was saying to him. I think he was saying, you know, does this mean we're friends? You know, he's he's really just trying to beg off, but he's but he's making fun of Snooka's uh, sign. Uh, Jimmy Snooker gets some clean with a pinfall, a, a flying body press off the top rope. Uh, the main event of this card is another boot camp match. This is the third boot camp match I've seen uh, in early 1984, Sergeant Slaughter and Iron Sheik, of course. And the themes of these matches uh, is blood. So during every interview promoting the um, boot camp match, uh, Sergeant Slaughter talks about how much he wants to make Iron Sheik bleed. And so the blood usually comes from uh, Sheik's boot. So Slaughter bleeds um, usually with a smash to a table outside of the ring or one of those awesome Sergeant Slaughter bumps where he gets whipped into the turnbuckle, goes over the turnbuckle, hits his head on the, on the post, and comes up bleeding. Uh, Iron Sheik bleeds when Slaughter uh, rips the foreign object out of the boot of the Iron Sheik and, and blasts him with it. So boot camp matches... They are fun. The, the best one is at MSG. MSG had the best boot camp match ever between Sheik and Slaughter. Uh, Non-wrestling related, this uh, Cap Center show is from, Madison, um, is from the USA Network. Uh, and it's full commercials, which I love. You know, so there's a lot of commercials for, how, for the USA Network. There's a lot of commercials for upcoming sports on the USA Network. Uh, but there's a couple of commercials that stood out to me, and I want to see if you remember. Do you remember the um, the Topol commercial? Now, Topol, T-O-P-O-L, was, I believe, a uh, a cigarette, like a like like a toothpaste for smokers, right? <laughs> and the grossest is this is the grossest marketing ever because in the in the very beginning of the commercial. A guy takes a puff of a cigarette, holds up a white hanky, and blows into the hanky, and it stains the hanky brown. Mm -hmm. So the Topol guy goes, look at this. Look at what you know is coming out of your mouth with cigarettes, this brown stain. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. So uh, I thought that was, was interesting. The other thing is... Uh, USA Network, there was a lot of um, television, like like uh, you could order stuff, right? You could order the four disc or the four album set of the greatest rock songs of the 60s. You could order the uh, cubic zirconium or zirconium uh, ring or earrings for $9.99. You know, there was a lot of stuff you could order. But what I noticed was the phone number for all of these items was the same. It was 1-800-USA-1000. That's what you would do. You would call 1-800-USA-1000 and order whatever was being sold on a commercial. So I was like, well, what's up with that? How did that work? You know, was the USA network behind the sales of all of these items and just came up with one phone number? I mean, they're very different commercials, you know, uh, and, and they're sold from different companies, I believe. You know, the albums are sold from a different company than the ring, uh, or the earrings, I assume. But the phone number was the same, 1-800-USA-1000. And that beautiful thing, COD, still existed back in June of 1984. Cash on delivery. Could you imagine that? You don't pay anything. You pay the postman when he brings you your item. How many times did that blow up in the postman's face? Honestly. How many times did the postman have to get in a fight with somebody? Because he's like, hey, I got your four albums here and they're like mm, I don't have any money well I gotta take the albums back oh I don't think so and pop 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 yeah so I think COD went away pretty quickly uh, after 1984 uh, that's that that is the uh, first third of June 1984 uh, coming up next is another TNT episode a couple more house shows and uh, about three more WWF championship wrestling TV shows We'll review them all here together. Hope you enjoyed this new format. Talk to you soon. Good night now.